Recording in. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to today's webinar themed Preparing for your first 2023 IFRS 17 External Audits, a quick guide. I am Perpetual Lati, a senior consultant with Assurance Units, and I'll be guiding us through a few housekeeping rules before we begin the webinar. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel so you can refer to it at your convenience. Also, all participants have been muted. So during our question and answer session, if you have any question, you can raise your hand and you will be allowed to speak on mute. Alternatively, you can also type in your questions or comments in our Q&A chat box and your comments or questions will be read in due time. Finally, getting to the end of the webinar, a survey link will be shared in our Q&A chat box and would, would appreciate if you could spend a few minutes to answer our questions as a link to answer and share with us your feedback on the webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. And at this point, I would hand over to my senior manager, Mr. Richard Omari, to kickstart the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petua. And everyone, you are warmly welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. And thank you for making time to join us. I'm going to be the moderator for the webinar. And with me, uh, we are going to have a very, very wonderful time together to know what it is all about that external auditors should be looking out for as long as the audit of 2017 financials is concerned. Please stay put, feel free to put in your questions in the chat box uh, when, if you have so. And a session where time will come where you would also be asked to unmute, like Perpetua said, to ask your questions. Without much ado, we would open the floor to the country managing partner for Deloitte, and then he will give us his opening remarks. So Dan, if you can hear me, please, I'm handing over to you now. Okay, um, good, good morning, uh, everyone uh, that has made time to uh, join this webinar and uh, uh, for, uh, Deloitte is, is a, an opportunity um, when we, we have the chance to uh, talk to you like this. Um, so on behalf of the partnership, I once again want to thank you for making time um, to be part of it. Um, so, so this webinar is particularly um, interesting and uh, we were starting to uh, train our staff, we're starting to actually prepare for um, the audit of the insurance companies, especially uh, the life insurance companies. And it just dawned on me that the things that we were talking about, it, it would be good to have a view and also to share some of the learnings that we've also uh, gone through over the years. And so I asked the team whether it was possible to have uh, this uh, open discussion. So. This is really not going to be um, us speaking and then you hearing. Uh, we are looking for opportunity for you to share what you are picking up. Um, so we, we, and I know this journey started some, some time ago and we all thought that we were never going to get to this point. But it looks like uh, we are here. And um, when each time we had training, I noticed that uh, 17, is much, much uh, complicated than uh, IFRS 9. And if we struggled with IFRS 9 a little bit uh, before we, we, we got a bit more comfortable. And then now we also have um, IFRS 17 um, to battle with. 
So I, I thought that it's a, it's a good opportunity uh, for us to share what we have actually, how we are actually approaching uh, the audit, uh, because uh, previously premiums that will go and premium was easy to test, uh, insurance liabilities, you get your actuaries to do that for you. And then there you are, you are reviewing your financial statement, your disclosures, and, and then there you go. But um, when we started looking at the transition to the financial statement that we are going to see, uh, the CSMs and the rest of it, um, I, I said to the team, uh, this is the opportunity that we have to have and we need to uh, share this idea and, and, and then see how we're going forward. So a lot of things that you are going to be bothered about and whether you are an auditor, whether you are um, an insurance company practitioner that you're on the call, there are things that are around data. Now, unlike before where our numbers, um, we were interested in the financial numbers. Now it's not like that because even an, an estimation of um, maturity, life maturity and the rest of it, once someone gets it wrong, that affects your numbers um, and, and, and then you then have to answer. There are things around even estimating cash flows. And, and, and these things, if, if somebody is estimating the cash flows and what's going to happen and they get it even one wrong, because you're estimating it for the life of the product, then you're also going to um, um, have to deal with that. So I don't want to take um, um, the, the, the meat out of the soup. I think we have a technical team um, that are ready to delve deep uh, into the subject matter. Uh, I will also be around and also to learn few lessons here and there from, um, from you who have joined us. Feel free to share your comments, feel free to ask your questions, and it's going to be as interactive as, as possible. And as you can trust us, um, we will summarize this feedback and share with everyone. So once again, thank you very much um, um, for making time to join us and um, we we'll look forward uh, to having uh, a very fruitful uh, webinar with you this morning. So Richard, let me pass it over back to you and, and then you can continue. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Usu, for, for uh, sharing that with us. And I know um, FR17 is, is, is a very interesting standard, but uh, before we know what the auditors are expecting, we would want to take um, a word for, from one of the IFRS experts, if not the IFRS 17 expert, expert in, Ghana, in Ghana, in the person of Kovna Situ. We want Kovna to hear from him. As an assurance partner at Deloitte Ghana. He is also the head of Deloitte Academy and a deputy leader for our financial services industry. He has more than 16 years post-qualification experience in all aspects of auditing, accounting, and consultancy services. He has acquired immense experience in international financial reporting standards, IFRS implementation and updates, an area he has and is still championing in West Africa. Kwabena has worked on various assignments for clients in the banking, insurance and oil and gas sector. He is also a key member of the Deloitte Africa Accounting and IFRS Specialist Group. Kwabena is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants UK and a member of Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana. He holds a degree in Sociology and Philosophy from the University of Ghana, Legon. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard, thank you. And thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, I heard Dan mentioning some technologies, and I was wondering, hey, has Dan turned into an actuarial person? He said he mentioned CSM. So I think it's a good way to start. Dan, thank you very much. It, it tells you that everything is learnable. You can really learn this thing very fast. So I'm going to show you a one slide. And this slide is what auditors will be interested in, right? So um, I will go straight away and show you that slide. And then I will talk you through the slide. And I think it's very important you pay attention here. Now, remember there are two sides of the coin. 
we have the implementers and then we have the external auditors who comes in to check what the implementers have done. So the implementer side will need to really understand the standard in terms of what the standard is bringing on board, the terminologies as Dan started mentioning some, the CSM, the BEL, the RA. So if you are an implementer, you are a consultant, you should be well versed in all these terminologies that comes on board. Now, also bear in mind that the way you analyze the performance and then the position of insurance companies are also totally changing, all right? So the auditors on the other side comes in and ensure that whatever you've done, they can then at the end of the day issue an opinion and, and say that whatever you've done is true and fair, right? So auditors have a key role to play for their stakeholders. So once the auditors are able to clear the accounts, the stakeholders, the investors, which includes the investors, can now consume what is you know, out there. Now there are eight pillars or eight processes that the auditors will be interested in. I will quickly take you through that eight processes. And maybe if Dan, you want to comment on any one of them, you can come in and then make a quick comment before we go into the Q&A session, which will be a very interactive and an interesting session. Now, the first key point that external auditors in 2023 audit for insurance companies will be interested about is the policy and methodology review papers. This is very, very important. Remember, this is a new standard and this standard comes with a whole lot of changes. There is a drastic change in the policies. So if you look at the policies that you, you were using before, as compared to what is now currently in force, you will see drastic changes. Now, you look at the standard like IES 8, it tells you that whenever there is a change in accounting policy by way of adopting a new standard, then you need to retrospectively, you know, restate the account. Now, it means that every company would have to get all these new policies in place. And let me mention here that these new policies must be approved by the board. So there must be governance around the new policies. And that is very, very important. So what are the new policies that the insurance company has put in place? Has it gone through the governance process? So the external auditors will be checking these things. Now, apart from the accounting policy papers, which will include things like CSM, that is the contractual service margin, which will also include things like the bell, the best estimates liability, the risk adjustments, the discount rates, all these policy papers must have gone through the governance process approved for it to be used in the implementation. So auditors will be interested in number one, do you have these accounting policy papers in place? Has it gone through the governance process? And these are very important. One thing the external auditors will also be checking is how you have done your product classification. And I think it is very, very important that you look at this very carefully because that is the starting point. When you get the first step wrong, it means everything that follows is totally wrong. It is garbage in, garbage out. So auditors are going to spend some quite number of time reviewing your new accounting policy papers, like what I've mentioned, the CSM, the Bell, the RA, you know, and all these things, these are very important papers that if you don't have them, and if it has not been approved 
by the by the right body within your entity, then it means you have a big issue to deal with your external auditors. Remember, they are coming to check whether you've done the thing in the right manner. So that is the first one. Number two, number two, number two. I've mentioned the review of the product classification, all right? And then it also involves whether each product, the group of products that you have, have they been assigned the right measurement models? So all these documentation will be reviewed. Have they been assigned the right measurement model? And what are these measurement models? The general measurement model is there, which we call the building block approach. We also have the simplified approach. All these things, have they been assigned correctly to the group of products? So that is very important. Now, you also have to move, they will move from there after the review of the policy papers and then go into your IT systems. So they will test your general IT controls, all right? And all these controls, they are going to look at it. The key data inputs. What was the data that you use in doing or churning out the numbers? And I'm also thinking the external auditors are also going to spend quite a time, quite an amount of time in dealing with data issues. So it means experts will be involved. Experts will be involved. Then you move from IT issues into actuarial model review. So remember, the IFRS 17 comes with um, various aspects. So you have the actuarial guys working with the accounting guys. Now, at the end of the day, the models that the actuarial team would develop, the external auditors will be interested in considering, number one, the data, the assumptions, the estimations of the cash flows, and then they are also going to test the calculations. How were the calculations done? How were the CSM calculated? How were the loss components calculated? So these are very important things that the external auditors will be interested in. It means that for insurance companies in 2023, you should have engaged your external auditors by now. You should have given them certain things they should be working with by now. If that has not been done, then it means that you are really in trouble. It means you are going to spend extra time and resources in getting these things done because these are serious things that external auditors will have to do it and do it very well. Now you move from the actuarial models and then you come to the financial reporting system, the financial statement and the related disclosures. Now, I can tell you, that the disclosures that is coming under IFRS 17 is not a child's play. It's not a child's play. So you need to also, the external auditors will also have to spend some time to review those disclosures. And how are the financial statements coming through? Remember, you are going to have a new fail of the profit and loss. So the profit and loss that you are used to is going to change totally. And I'm sure in the Q&A, they are going to tell you some of these changes, all right? So external auditors will be interested in how the old chart of accounts, for example, have been mapped into this new IFRS uh, you know, chart of accounts. So these are very important processes that external auditors will be interested in. Now, we will give you this one slide to guide you, especially those in the insurance company so that you can take your time and then break these things down, understand it carefully, let you know what the external auditors want, and then when they come, you can equally and squarely face them. But the external auditors are really going to demand a lot from you when it comes to IFRS 17. Then there are also other wider business implications of the IFRS 17. For example, taxation, how are the taxes going to play out? 
external auditors want to know the key performance indicators, key performance ratios. How are they going to be calculated? Are they being calculated rightly? All these wider considerations will be considered by the external auditors. And then lastly, the eighth point, which is also very, very important, is the whole implementation program. The whole implementation program. What was the project governance around this whole implementation program? Were the involvement of key management personnel? Were the key management personnel attending certain key meetings? Were they vitally involved? Can we, can the external auditors, you know, pinpoint that the MD was sitting in this meeting? This decision was taken, he was involved. The, the other key management personnel, were they involved in this mega project? So that is also something that external auditors are going to look. So ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be business as usual. The whole thing is changing. It has changed actually drastically. So these eight things, these eight reviews are what the external auditors are going to focus on. So if you don't get these eight processes and reviews right, it means that there will be questions around your implementation of the IFRS 17. So there is work to be done. Done. What do you think? There is work to be done. <laughs> okay, so Conrad, thank you. So, so there is work to be done, and it's not it's not an easy an easy work. So, if you take each of the uh, the box, especially if you take um, policy uh, review and the uh, methodology itself, and mm -hmm. even looking at the product classification, how the insurance company has classified the products. Because mm. at the end of the day, you know, we are going to group them because we are going to use estimation method. Mm. So if, if you classify them wrongly, then you get to a point and you realize that grouping these particular products together, you are not able to estimate what is going to happen uh, and, and, and that's going to give you exactly. a lot of problems. So product application and the initial discussions and approval by the governance team mm -hmm. is very, very important mm -hmm. because that is the one that is now going to drive the rest of the things throughout uh, the, the process. And again, mm -hmm. I think you talked about it. One key thing is the data. Mm -hmm. The data that are going to be keyed in. Because don't mm. forget, when you take any product, what you are going to do now, unlike before, now you are going to estimate everything that is going to happen in, on the life, lifetime of that particular product that you have taken. Exactly. And then every year you are now going to be reviewing. So mm. if you estimate and you estimate it wrongly, what you have estimated for the future is going to have impact mm. on what you are mm. arriving uh, 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 this year. Testing the completeness and accuracy of the data is very, very crucial. And I mm. think I'll leave it there. But what so, one thing so Dan, is, very be, is also be, about before, the statement. Yes. Yeah, before before you go, so you go to a client and with these eight processes, you are not comfortable with how the client has gone about these eight processes. The client do not have even the policies approved. Um, there are issues to to the data they are using. You are, you, are, you are not seeing all these things happening. So let me put you on the spot. Are you going to issue a clean opinion? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't we haven't got there yet. So 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 we haven't got there yet. But but I think this process started quite not long ago, and I think exactly I've been working with the insurance companies um yeah. for, for for some time now. And I mm. think this is the one of the reasons why we are trying to do this. So at least people can go back and, mm. and, and check and get their documentations and, and up to date. So mm. key thing, the policy is very important. The methodology that you have followed has to be documented. Mm. It has mm. to be approved. It has mm. to have, it ought to have gone through the governance process sure. and has been approved. And then sure. you then move through 
that stage, your IT system is also crucial because mm. you are not going to be able to use fresh heat to do mm. these numbers. You mm. have to have a system that we can use this so that you can roll them forward from year mm. to year and the data can be intact. So you are exactly. then making sure that all information that needs to be included in the system has been included and sure. all information that has to be excluded has been excluded. It's exactly. so important because exactly. the rest of the things are all going to be automated. Some of the things yeah. are going to be automated. And mm. so if you don't get the data right, and if you don't get the definition, if you don't get the input right, you are mm. going to get it wrong. I believe uh, people are ready. I strongly believe so. <laughs> this guy okay. is not going to be straightforward. I, I can assure everyone. Yeah. Because mm. if I compare this with IFRS 9, for example, mm. I would say this is three times difficult than IFRS 9. Yeah. Three yeah. times difficult than IFRS 9. Awesome. So yeah. we, we should not um, um, uh, take it for granted, but I think exactly. it's, we are, it's a starting point and definitely yeah. we, we will master it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, uh, Richard. But just to mention that the NIC is also coming up with a guide for the industry. So it will also help ease the pressure within the industry. So I think I needed to also mention that, yeah. All right, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. So back to you, Richard. I think I've taken more time than expected. <laughs> I mean, you should know wow. me by now. So <laughs> I know you. I know you. <laughs> thank <Kovna>. you very much. <laughs> and then back to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Kovna. That that has been very very uh, insightful in terms of the eight points that you've highlighted. You know, um, I am I am part of the implementation team, and most most of um, our clients will know that I'm on their team. But uh, for the purpose of this uh, program or this webinar we have actually introduced the key auditors and the audit partners in Deloitte to join us uh, to answer some questions around when it comes to the audit, what they will be looking out for. So at this moment, we are going to introduce uh, a panel to go into a QA and a session so that at least we know what the, their expectations actually are as long as the 17 audit is concerned. So uh, given the the panelists, we have uh, the first person we would have would be um, the Mrs. Charlotte Forsen Abbey, who is the financial services industry leader of Deloitte. So we can introduce her. The video is going to be played, and then she will take her seat. Richard is a senior manager in the Audit and Assurance Hello, Unit in Deloitte, Ghana. So, he is a chartered accountant with about 10 Charlotte. years of experience. He is a member of the Deloitte. Charlotte Forsen Abbey is a partner with the Deloitte Garners Audit and Assurance Group and has been with Deloitte since 2001. She has extensive experience working with clients in a variety of industries, serving both the indigenous and international markets. She has spent the last 22 years working with professionals worldwide, providing services that include financial statements audits, fraud investigation, and financial accounting. In addition to a full audit and assurance client portfolio, she is also a member of the Deloitte West Africa Risk Team and has championed various compliance programs in risk, ethics, and independence in Ghana. She is a chartered accountant by profession and holds a master's degree in business administration from the Paris Graduate School of Management. Charlotte is an old student of Wesley Girls High School and the University of Cape Coast. She is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants UK and a member of Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana. Mama Mati is a chartered accountant with a world of comprehensive experience in audit and assurance engagements across all sectors of the Ghanaian economy. Emmanuel is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana and holds an MSc in Information Management and Finance from the University of Westminster UK. He was also a regular facilitator for Deloitte Africa's training programs and was part of the Deloitte team that rolled out the firm's IFRS market offer. His record of effective working relationship with top management of medium, large, national and multinational organizations within and outside Ghana makes him an asset on all engagements. 
Emmanuel has the international exposure of working in the United Kingdom, South Africa, Mali, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Kenya, and Egypt. Hager is an assistant manager and actual lead consultant in the Audit and Assurance Unit in Deloitte, Ghana. She is a near qualified actuary with student membership from the Society of Actuaries, USA. She has over six years of experience in actual practice in Ghana and West Africa. Her major area of practice includes IFR 17 implementation, IAS 19 employee benefit valuation, valuation of life fund and technical reserve, and product development of insurance products. All right, uh, you are welcome, um, Charlotte. Emmanuel and then Hega, you're welcome if you want to see your faces. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Nah, yeah. Thank you. Welcome, welcome for welcome to this webinar and, and thank you for your time because your I know your times are very expensive. And so, but we managed you managed to spare us some time to answer these questions. So you're welcome. So let me maybe before we, we go into the Q and A, can you give us your general expectations? Uh, of what uh, audit is supposed to look like under the IFRS 17. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, let me start. Good morning again to everyone. Um, so, well, I think Kamna and, and Daniel have said a lot. The, the standard is um, a bit more complex than nine. We thought nine was difficult, but this, we realized that um, 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 nine was even um, um, less difficult than what we are seeing now. But I believe that um, as we we did with the nine, with all the trainings and the interventions, working with our clients um, over the past few years, uh, we have decoded nine and we are running with it. So um, maybe the first year or two will be a little bit tough because of the changes, as with everything anyway. But then I'm sure that um, as we progress and um, there are more learning, with more support, um, I'm sure we will break that as well. And there are a bit more expectation. I mean, when you want standardization, it comes with too many things, but I believe that um, we'll break too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you too. Emmanuel, can we pick your general overview? Yes, um, um, good morning, um, everyone, and thanks, um, Richard. So like the earlier um, speakers have said, this is new, um, it looks um, a bit, um, complex, but I believe that just like we've done for other standards in the past, once we put ourselves together and dedicate ourselves to learning and following the processes and procedures and all the interventions that have been put in place, including what NIC has done, we should be able to get around this and then break the code and the jinx around it. I believe this is doable and, and we we'll all work together to get it done. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. So uh, you, you are ready to assist clients to at least maneuver and then go through the process easily. Uh, thank you. All right. So, um, Hega, if you can hear me, you have been part, I know you have been part of the implementation of the 17. What do you think the external auditors sh should be looking out for as long as this audit is concerned? You being an implementer. Hega, you, we can't hear you. You muted. If you can unmute yourself. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Hega. Hello. Yes, can I be heard? All right. Good. Sure. Yes. Okay. So as I uh, as Dan and as Dan and um, Kabna has said earlier on, all is revolving around data, and I think it's a key area auditors will be looking at, and precisely looking at how data is keyed in the system and how it's supporting the actual process in coming out with the insurance contract liabilities and how um, unbundling is done, especially the groupings as well. So, those are the areas auditors will be keenly be looking out for to make sure that the numbers are right and they do their audit process. So those are the very key areas they will look at. Oh, I see. 
Okay, thank you. Then it means external auditors seem to have a lot of work to be doing now. Uh, very lot of it. <laughs> I see. All right. Okay. So um, uh, my partners and um, auditors, I know um, that in the mix of the participants, we have um, insurers amongst us, insurance practitioners, we have various diverse people. Some may have knowledge about the IFRS 17, some may not. I know there would be also um, auditors, or um, let me say auditors amongst us uh, listening to us. But I want to ask this, and I know, Charlotte, maybe this may go to you since you are the uh, financial services leader. So given the complexities of IFRS 17 now, would you accept if a client decides to say, I'm doing the IFRS 17 implementation on my own without the help of a consultant? Or do you necessarily need the clients or the insurers to use consultants? Okay, process. thanks, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, it's not a yes or no answer. It's what's the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. If the insurers have the capacity, the, they have the actual specialists in their midst to be able to do everything that uh, the standard requires, then yes, we are okay. We, when we go in there, we are going to look at the work that we have done anyway, and also do our own independent um, reviews and testing. However, if um, they don't have that uh, capacity in in house, then really it's important that they get consultants. And we've said there's no business as usual. It it it, it entails a lot. If um, in the past the the, the um, actuarial specialist was doing maybe a third of everything on the on the balance sheet, now they are doing more almost everything. So yes, that 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 is it. If they have the capacity, and you know that as as part of our work, we actually look at um, key key management and even personnel doing uh, various roles and functions. In the, in the, on the field, then we look at their qualifications and experience and all of that. So yes, if they do have it, otherwise uh, we recommend strongly that they should get an external consultant to help them with that. Thanks. Yeah, ah, that's great. And I think that will be a relief for most uh, clients now because uh, there, there, there's, I'm sure there's tension on people when to force and then get consultants to come and help them. But uh, participants, as you have heard, if, if you have the in-house capacity and you can do it, the auditors are ready to look at. Maybe let me come to Emmanuel. I know, and I think Kwabna mentioned it, that the NIC is coming out with a guide to regulate um, this IFRS 17. Would auditors accept that guide, given that the standard actually dictates what it's supposed, uh, what entities are supposed to do? Sorry, Emmanuel, you're muted. I see you are talking, but you're muted. Yes, thank you, Richie. Mm -hmm. uh, so the NIC guide, um, like in my previous answer, what NIC is trying to do is just to support the process and ensure that the implementation of IFRS 17 is seamless. And the guide they have adopted, as we have all reviewed, is in line with IFRS. So their guide is just to make sure that they are assisting the process and then ensuring that there's uniformity across the industry in the country, but it's not a departure from IFRS. And that is not what we'll be quoting, but that is just helping us to soften the grounds in our quest to implement and adopt the IFRS um, 17. Oh, okay. So auditors, you accept um, the guide as well. Uh, thank yeah, you for that. Because it's, it's, it's just going to support the work that um, all of us are going to be doing. Okay, ah, thank you. That's that's quite um, interesting to hear. And yeah, we, we will look forward to what uh, transpires in the course of um, the audit. So Charlotte, let me, let me come to you. Uh, now let's go into a little more uh, technicalities when it comes to the audit. Can you give us an overview of some of the areas that as auditors you will be focused on in terms of the review? Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, maybe I'll, I'll chip in one, one or two things. Um, what are we interested in? So we are saying that um, one of the process we'll be looking at is the unbundling of the um, products, the product assessment on, for unbundling. So now we are saying that usually when the premiums are, are received, it's not always for like a, a pure, uh, maybe insurance risk contract. Sometimes there are investment components and all of that in there. Now, one of the key processes that IFRS 17 is asking for is that you need to ensure that you separate 
the non-insurance components of your contract from the, the real um, insurance component. And that process is unbinding. So we'll look at how the insurer has done that in, in their books. Another thing that we are also interested in is the, uh, how uh, the grouping has been done. I think Daniel mentioned grouping along the line. So um, we are saying that um, 17 says, you don't just put everything together. We have uh, various levels of the grouping, level one, two, and three. So for example, in level one, we look, we look at how similar risks have been grouped. We look at all of these things. The unbundling and the grouping are really like the basics of uh, starting the whole process. When this is not done right, it will affect the subsequent things like the determination of your bill and all of that. So we look at how the grouping has been done. We look at how the contract boundary has been determined. What measurement approach has the insurer also used? Um, is it the, the, the building blocks or what the premium allocation? So the BBA, the PAA, I'm sure these are some terms hmm. that don't be too scared. They are all um, easy to understand. So we look at how the measurement uh, approach that the insurer has used. And even in terms of using the, the PAA, which is the, the premium allocation approach, this is usually used for the short-term contract, those within um, 12 months, that's a year. We'll do an elig eligibility test to see whether, if that approach has been really used for those contracts that fall uh, within the 12 months or less, or it's been used for even longer term ones, you have to test that as well. We need to look at how revenue has been determined by the, by the, by the entity, because now as you are unbundling, you only what you have to show as insurance revenue is really what speaks to that per the standard and nothing else. We also look at uh, things like the, the contractual service um, margin. What is the logic that was used in determining that one? We have to look at the um, application of the coverage unit that was used. How is it amortized? And then we, the, most significantly, uh, Kwamna mentioned that um, disclosures a presentation of our numbers and disclosures have changed significantly. We are going to delve deep on that. We are going to spend more time because now these disclosures must be in line with what the standard is saying. Presentation must be done according to the, the, the samples that have been given and all of that. So these are some of the major things that um, um, auditors are also going to look at when it comes to reviewing the IFRS 17 and um, financials and, um, and the work that has been done in booking and um, the transactions and all of that. Thank you very much. So, in fact, I like it when you said those are the major areas. You know, as part of the implementation team, I have seen that every single thing that you mentioned is part of the process. So, literally, what we are looking at is every aspect of the implementation process is going to be reviewed. That's right. That's that's a lot of work. But would auditors have the luxury of time to do all this? That's why we need to start. Uh, in good time. I'm sure um, interims have been done or they are being done. And I think thankfully NIC has given um, some time frame uh, for reporting. We have moved from the standard uh, by 31st March or 30th April. Now we know that for general business, they are reporting by 30th April. I think that the standard really pushes a lot on the life insurance and they are reporting this uh, um, um, 30th June. So we do have some time, but we should never think that, oh, it's too much time or it's so far away. We need to start now. If you haven't started already, we need to start now and get running. Let's see, now, thank you very much for letting us know. So Imano, uh, so given the areas that Charlotte mentioned that we'll be reviewing, what are the key risk areas? Can we focus, zoom in on the key risk areas? Thank you, Richard. Um, the, I think the interesting and the most comfortable thing for auditors is that our audit processes are not changing. So, so just like we're doing under IFRS 4, we'll first be looking at um, um, ISA 240, where we have the presumed risk of fraud in relation to revenue recognition and the management of right of controls. So we will still be deferring to that, and then we'll be focusing um, on the revenue recognition so far as um, 17 is, is concerned. So we'll be performing all our processes, our DNI, and where we are relying on operating effectiveness of controls, we'll also test that and then perform further substantive procedures. 
the only thing that is changing is that the volume of work will now have increased, but the audit processes are not going to change around that. And then the other area, and which will also be part of the management of our right of controls is in relation to the insurance liabilities, which because this involves a lot of estimation, will also be performing the same work, just that this time it is much more complex as than what we used to do under um, IFRS 4. So those are the key areas that as auditors will still be focusing on so far as um, the audit of IFRS 17 is concerned. And one other area that it has also will be coming up is around onerous contracts. So as we go through the process where there are onerous contracts, we want to understand why there are onerous contracts and whether the workings around them are accurate and then we'll perform other procedures that we'll need to do. And then last but not the least is also the systems that have been implemented. Um, we will be involving our IT specialists to also do some work around that. And also um, our actuarial specialist will also be assisting us around the valuation process and the systems that have been put in place. So these are some of the key areas we'll be looking at as well. Wow, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for mentioning that. Well, so um, participants, uh, over to you. So these are some of the key areas that the auditors will be looking at. So just, uh, just be ready. And if you have consultants that are helping you or you are even doing it all by yourself, make sure you understand all these processes uh, so that you can give them the required uh, information. Now, let me go to Hager. Hager, I know you are part of the implement, you have been, you are assisting a lot of clients towards the implementation. Where do you think are some of these key issues that auditors should be looking at? Because give, uh, and I have to put you on the spot because I know you are, you are doing part, you are part of the dirty work um, that we are work doing. Yes. Hager, we can't hear you. All right, hello. Yes, okay, we can so hear you now. one of the key points is data. And data is the main driver of everything. Mm -hmm. So auditors need to make sure that maybe product descriptions are right so that the accurate uh, methodology they have to use for it, making sure that um, there's consistency in the data as per what has been booked as to the actuals. And the IFRS 4, we just do uh, the insurance liabilities. We don't do analysis of change from the open to closing. But IFRS 17, what happened last year, you have to make sure you break down what has happened over the year and how you got to the end of your closing balance. So these are key things they have to make sure. And all these changes is backed by data. So data must be the key source of it all. So if it's, if it's wrong, everything is wrong. But if it's right, then your, your results is also fine. And your, maybe you have to focus on assumptions. But from that, I think this is a very key area. Then maybe how the actuarial model was done, maybe they, sh they should have a challenger model to make sure that all these are fine. But in far and wide is simply data. I like the use of the word challenger model. <laughs> so yeah, it's very interesting. Can you explain what that is? Because uh, someone may want to ask, what is it? What's a challenger model? All right, so it's basically a work done by someone else and you are doing the same thing just to make sure that um, the numbers are right. So somebody use PA approach. You also use the same PA approach based on the model you have developed to make sure that the numbers to align. So it's a challenger model just to test the accuracy of the numbers. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. So those are uh, technical areas that uh, we, we, are, we are mentioning. So, and I know uh, participants are taking their deep notes and then they are going to, so I know because you are part of the implementation, people are going to come at you heavily. 
<laughs> given what you have said all by us. <laughs> now, all right, okay, so let's go to our um, auditors. So um, maybe Charlotte, you want to take the, this question for me. Um, now, let me, because, and I will have to give you this question because you also doubled as the um, insurance, uh, the financial services leader. <laughs> and I want to ask you about IFRS 9. I'll go, I know I'll go back into the IFRS 17. Now, um, to the best of my knowledge, IFRS 9 and then the 17 must be complied together. But this is the case, a client comes to you and said that, oh, I have always been focused on the 17. So I have done my 17 financials and then I present to you as an auditor. Would you accept? <laughs> Richard, um, I think we'll, I, will not, I will not accept, auditors will not accept that. Oh, wow. um, I think all of us in the industry have been aware that um, the 9 and 17 were supposed to go, uh, I think, together. If it hadn't even been for COVID, I'm sure it would have been done already. <laughs> um, so um, since they are supposed to be complied with together, then it means that we cannot issue a clean opinion or just comply with 17 when you haven't done um, 9. It will definitely impact your opinion if you have not complied with the 9, I'm sure. Um, not to rush into any decision, but I'm sure that uh, a, a modified opinion will be, may, is likely to be issued uh, for non-compliance with nine if that has not been done. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so, so then it leads me to another question. What will you be looking out for on the nine as an uh, Okay. So um, I think we'll be looking um, at things like how the um, insurer has um, even classified their financial assets, you know, um, with um, IFRS now, we look at classification and measurements of how of your financial assets. We will look at what has been done. Uh, we'll be looking at how um, the express, expected credit losses on the financial assets have been have been determined. You know, the ECL is um, is a, is is the main, main main thing when it comes to the impairment reviews. So look at what what has been what has been done. How was it determined? Uh, what has the insurer put in place for its um, expect, uh, exposure? At default, the EAD, what we call the EAD, the PD, all, we are looking at all of those things, how they've been determined. So um, the insurer has done their work, either they've done it by themselves or even for nine, some people also use um, consultants. So yes, and then we, we go in there to look at how all of these have been determined, the assumptions, underlying assumptions, and whether um, they are in line with what the standard says, and then we do our own checks to ensure that um, they have been full compliance with the nine as well. I hope that helps. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I think it, it does. It does. And, and, and thank you. You put it uh, right and very, very simple. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I want to, Emmanuel, let me come back to the IFRS 17. Let me come back. What are some of the governance areas you'll be looking out for as long as the audit of the 17th process is concerned? Well, thank you, Richard. Um, so if you listen to Kavanaugh's initial presentation, you'll be some of the governance areas will be around the policies that have been adopted um, because the board owns the financials. They want to understand and approve the, the policies and the methodologies that are being um, implemented. These are key. To, so that they are well aware of what is happening and how the whole process um, is, is, is going. So it is imperative that the board is uh, 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 highly involved and they approve all of the processes and all the other policies that uh, are going to be used in, in um, the application of the 17. And then one other area will also be the financial reporting process, which has always been under their control. They will also will have to review the financial reporting process and make sure that that is also approved. And that evidence of approval should be available for auditors to um, review, Omari. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, good to hear. Uh, no, uh, Emmanuel, and 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 then it means that part, uh, participants uh, must be um, noting all these points that you have mentioned. So um, let me go into the Q and A box and then see. 
I'll pick one or two questions from there. Then we can we'll take a, a, a small break. Then you can maybe have some um, drink or coffee, and then we'll come back and then continue. So let me let me see what uh, participants are asking in the Q and A box. Uh, yeah, let me go in there. Okay, so I have this new first question. Very interesting. Will this new standard and and here Kwabna and then Higa, please be on standby for me. Will this new standard affect insurance premiums and also the terms concerning how insurance companies pay compensation for an insurance that has been taken? <laughs> oh, wow. That's a very, very interesting <laughs> one. Higa, the way you are smiling right. at this question, would you want to take this one? All right. So um, I have everything that doesn't change the way insurers do their business. It only affects how they are reporting. So that's the difference. So whatever you are doing as day-to-day -day business remains the same. But when it comes to reporting your business activities, it's where it's changing. So if premium is 100 CDs, it's 100 CDs. It's simply the same as it is. But how you are reporting the 100 CDs is what is changing. So that is the technicalities of IFI 17. So, so it means it is for the reporting of the insurance and not the compensation uh, to the no. uh, policyholders. Okay. Yes. All right. Th sure. Thank you very much, um, Ega. Now, there's a very interesting question here. Is it? Uh, how is the audit team handling insurers that are using Deloitte as their transition consultant? <laughs> Anyway, that will be very interesting. So for you, uh, and it's been asked that by Charles, for you, Deloitte cannot even go there. It's, let me maybe give that answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Deloitte cannot even go near it at all because as a consultant, we can't review the works that we have also uh, done. All right, so I think that will answer you. Okay, so on this note, uh, can we take uh, maybe some 30 minutes break, uh, 30 seconds break, sorry, so that you can sip some water, take some water, uh, my panelist, and then we'll come back and then continue. Thank you very much. So please take some water, everyone, and then uh, we'll continue shortly. To better understand your business, Sometimes you need a different perspective. One that takes nothing at just its face value. That dives deeper into detail. To find deeper truths and greater insights. And at Deloitte, this is just where we begin. Connecting the brightest minds with effective processes and world-class technology. We go beyond expectations. We deliver the highest quality audit and assurance services. We focus on the detail so you can see the bigger picture. Deloitte. If your audit looks remotely the same today as it did five years ago, Chances are, you're leaving a lot of unrealized value on the table. Imagine an audit that flexes with change and suits your business needs, no matter how complex. What does it take to get there? Leading edge technology, exceptional people, and real time insights that can lead to a brighter future for you and your business. At Deloitte, we don't just dream big, we do big. That's why we created a global cloud-based audit platform, an infrastructure that enhances our responsiveness and agility and gives you greater visibility into your audit. And that's why we leverage automation and cognitive technologies to get more from your data. With transparent, tailored, and customized analytics, we'll help you understand mm -hmm. the risks and opportunities that matter most. After all, We've cultivated trust and confidence in capital markets for over 150 years. We solve for now and build for next. A more meaningful audit is here. That's the Deloitte way. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Emmanuel, Charlotte, and then Higa, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's, let's move on. 
uh, please I have some more questions for you. Uh, and then again, we will take the participants' um, questions there. Yeah. So maybe just maybe um, two questions each, if you are ready. Uh, let me uh, let me let me just take my 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 two questions. Yeah, and I think my first question will be around governance, and then I'll ask Emmanuel, wh what do you think will be the board's role in 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 in, um, in this audit? The board of the entities, what will be their role? Richard, this appears to be the uh, question that you asked just before we, we left the for yes. the <laughs> coffee break. So yes. just to reiterate that mm -hmm. the board, one of the uh, two key areas they'll be interested in is the governance around the whole process, um, data input, the governance around the assumptions that are being used. And then last but not the least um, is the governance around and approval of the accounting and policies and assumptions um, around that, which will be in the financial statement. And then again, they will also be interested in uh, um, the governance around the whole financial reporting process. Um, it's an areas that they will also be very um, interested in and they will want to be involved and make sure that these are properly approved and they are aligned with um, the business model that is being um, run. Okay, so so and, and I think maybe this question may go for Shalom. Let's say, I mean, we are um, you go to a client, and and please feel free to answer this question. You go to a client, and then the client tells you that the standard is very very complex. We did all that we could, but we couldn't meet the regulator's timelines. What will you do to uh, assist with the audit? Okay, so um, they couldn't meet the regulator's timeline. I think the first thing yeah. uh, we'll do is uh, probably get the, the company to seek for some kind of extension. It may come with some penalties in, in any case, um, but then um, you can't, since it's already, the harm has already been done, you have to do that. Or at least let them be aware that you'd be late because of, um, uh, one, of one or two issues. Um, I think that NIC, even though they've given some extensions already, they will be a little bit lenient because it's still learning ground for us. However, it is not a, an excuse really not to do it at all. In fact, it's a must. Once um, um, under ICA, we have all signed on to report based on IFRS, and then 17 and 9 are now being ruled. I mean, 17 and 9 are also part of the whole IFRS um, and that we are, we are reporting on. You will need to comply. We really don't have an option to say that uh, we are not complying with 17. If you are not complying with 17, what are you going to report on? Because um, that's what that's where the whole world is also is also going. So it's important that the intervention so we'll, we'll plan with the client. We'll see um, what we can do to speed up the process. I know that sometimes as auditors, we need to sacrifice a lot a lot more time. And most of the time, it's not even in all cases that we are even able to charge things like overrun, overruns because of the extra work that we buy. So also call on a, a more commitment from both the, uh, the insurer and then from the audit team as well. And then we'll bring on board people like you to do, I mean, speed up the review processes. We are already working with you in any case. Mm -hmm. I will bring on board people like you to also um, help with the, with, with the client to get it over the, over the line because we, there's no option, as I've said. 17 is the way to go and that's what we have to review. No. And, and so, so, yeah. so for what you've said, you know, I was going to ask you, so what if the client does not comply and still brings you an IFRS for financial statements to review? What would be your opinion? <laughs> that one would definitely be a qualified opinion because you are not um, uh, reporting on what is required. Oh, the standard to be used is 17. And the opinion I'm issuing, I'm supposed to have reviewed everything in line with 17. So if it's not done, then it means that uh, that, that part of the opinion where we talk about compliance with regulatory and standard and all of those, it means that the whole thing, even how the numbers have been, been determined in terms of the revenue and all that, it means that they have not been done as per the standard. And so we have to uh, qualify the uh, opinion. Thank you. Wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's so harsh, Charlotte. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, but I, I hope we don't get there. I hope we don't okay. get there. Good, good. Yeah, I also, I also uh, pray so. 
Yeah. Maybe let me ask uh, Emmanuel. So, given all this that we have discussed, um, knowing that you are going to bring, I've seen that uh, I think in the course of discussions, there have been mentioning of going to bring on Achuya experts, IT experts on the, on, the, on the audit team this time around. Uh, is there any cost implication in there for, for insurers to be aware of? You know, auditors, I know you charge by time, so we want to know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah. There might be a little adjustment to the cost, um, which will impact the, the client because remember this time the volume of work that is being done is a lot. There will be a lot of man hours that our Acura experts will have to put into, into the work um, in supporting us, unlike IFRS 4 the number of man hours that they will have to put into the IFRS 70 is, is, is quite a lot. And I mean, you know, as service providers, we only have our time to, to sell. And so far as we are selling more time, we will expect that will be adequately compensated. But I'm sure these are things that we can always discuss with the clients and then come to a point where um, it will be comfortable for them to absorb those costs. And then we'll also see areas where we'll also be able to see some of those costs as our own investment into those clients and into, into our work. So it's not as if we are going to pass on all the costs to them, but it will come through discussion. We'll see some as an investment into the work we are doing, and then the clients will also absorb some of those costs. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And I think, I, I think that is quite comforting because I know the implementation process is actually even costly. So given that we have to pay more for audits and you are, you are willing to share costs, I think clients will appreciate that. So when that comes up, uh, uh, please clients feel free to discuss with the auditors and then uh, they, they, they will be considerate with you. Okay, so I think um, those, those will be my questions for now, but now let me go to the chat box again and then pick the questions that uh, uh, participants have put in out there. So someone is asking Anonymous, what is contractual service margin? Each This is uh, technical. It means the person is not even within our industry. <laughs> and that is that is let me try and then put it in a simple way that is the deferred revenue or deferred profit for the insurers now under the ifrs 17 and how you get that is a whole process so you are welcome to contact us uh, uh, privately and then we can give you more explanations into that then a question here and i think Higa, this one will go for you it's unbundling a requirement in short-term contracts using paa because it yes. was mentioned and uh, no, okay. it depends on how the product is, the product specification is. So if, if in the product you have a service uh, attached to it, and it is part of the insurance premium, whereby you can't separate it, you can't okay. separate it. So you have to use a whole premium to do your insurance liability. But where oh, okay. it's an added on service where you can separate, then definitely, yes, the service has to be measured under FIS 15. Okay, thank you. So it means that it depends at the product assessment level, we will get to know. All yes. right, so th sure. thank you very much for that, Hega. Okay, there's a question here. So this one, uh, the person is highlighting Mr. C2. So Mr. C2, please be on standby for me. Where a consultant is involved, Will the auditors still focus on governance issues in terms of approval of accounting policies, management uh, attendance of me in meetings, et cetera, as highlighted by Mr. C2? Okay, so then um, my auditors are still here to answer that. So I don't know who would want to take it. Charlotte Fosse, uh, Imano? Okay. No, let me, oh. let, me, let me take it. Okay, Imano. So, okay, cool. So yes, so the insurance companies, <clears throat> would have asked for the services of the management expert who is the consultant. But ultimately the board takes ownership and responsibility for the work that will be done by the consultant. So all those things that were mentioned by City will still have to be implemented and added to. <coughs> oh, please. Sorry. Please, please get some water for us. 
he is unwinding his CSM. Oh, okay. <laughs> Charlotte, you want to add a word to it? <laughs> You're um, muted, okay, I'm Charlotte. trying to unmute. Yeah. yeah. So yes, um, the, the consultant is working for man. I mean, for management. So we we mm. we still need to have that demonstration that um, the, um, the the governance um, team are aware of all that is going on. I mean. The fact that somebody is working this out for you, I think there's a need for you to also understand what is going on as well, and then um, and ensure that the right processes and, and things are all in place in, in the whole uh, scheme of things. So at least there should be interest shown by management and even those um, in charge of governance uh, on the processes that are being turned out for you. Your numbers are, that are coming out for you. So um, you, should you should take ownership of them. Thank you. Emmanuel, your final words on that? Yes, so like Charlotte has said, the board owns the financial statements because they are going to sign off to it and therefore they should be interested in all the processes that are put in place to which results in the final numbers they are going to sign off. And therefore it oh, is important okay. that even if we have the consultants we are still involved as a project plan that the board are, are, are briefed regularly and they ask questions so that they'll be able to own the process and own the outcome of that process. Mm, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that answers it. Okay, the next question is, is Atria service really necessary in the com computation of liabilities for short-term contracts? that do not have financing components and are within 12 months. I think this one, I'll leave it to Mr. C2. So Mr. C2, if you are here, the question is, is, is Achiria service really necessary in the I computation of question. liabilities? That's Hager. Uh, we should give this to Hager. Okay, uh, Hager. Hager, take it for us. <laughs> All right, so um, I-5 is a new standard. And if the insurer or reinsurer has the capacity to do it in-house, then they can do it. But you know that for any professional work that you do, you have to sign up by an external actuary. So even if you do it internally like audit, an external actuary has to make sure that the numbers are fine. So you need an external actuary to sign off. But in all cases, Actuarial uh, personnel is involved in the process as an uh, actuarial professional has to also sign off. Either you can do it by yourself or you, you see that portion of your work to a consultant to do it for you. But either case, you still need an actuary to sign off. Right. Thank you very much. So you can do it on your own, but you need an actuary to eventually sign off for you. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Higa. So this question is coming from. Um, uh, Janice. Janice is asking, what are the jurisdictions under which IFRS 17 is recognized? You do not want to do financial report that has some significant, uh, yeah, report that has some significant limited, I might say, he was trying to say limitations in terms of approval or recognition. So uh, maybe to answer that one, if you are an insurer or you issue an insurance contract and you report using IFRS, you need to do IFRS 17. And so Janice, that answers your, your question. So Mami Kunedu is asking, hello, to what extent will IFRS 17 affect the testing of controls? So this one to auditors, with regards to premium, since premium is comprised of estimate now estimate now we are likely to identify a fraud risk around the estimate can mr marty kindly reiterate <laughs> mr marty it appears this person knows you very well mommy kennedy knows you <laughs> so mr marty emmanuel can you reiterate so she's asking what would the uh, what extent will IFRS 17 affect the testing of controls with regards to premiums? Since premium is comprised of estimates now, we are likely to identify a fraud risk around the estimate. Can you talk to this? Yes, so 
I think one of the questions you asked where I didn't mention ISA 240, where we have fraud in relation to the revenue recognition process. And then we also have the estimates embedded in the test of the management method of controls. So when you do your risk assessment, you have to break this into two. You do risk assessment for the revenue recognition, and then there will also be risk assessment for um, the accounting estimates, um, which is more of the insurance liabilities now, which are embedded in the management of overhead of control. So through your risk assessment, you pinpoint your risk for each of the two, which is revenue and then the um, insurance contracts. And you then perform, test your design and implementation of controls for each of those two. And where you also want to rely on controls, you also then test your creating effectiveness of controls for the risks you identified for revenue recognition and then the risks in relation to the uh, estimates which will result in, in which will go into the insurance contracts. Thank you very much for that. Now, Hayford is asking, Hagan has rightly stressed the need for data. Where this is not available, see a new entity without um, historic data. Oh, sorry. Without historic um, data for the estimation of probabilities and amounts of future payments or an entity that just did not have a good system for data. What can be done now? I like this question. <laughs> there is no data. And, and Higa would want right. to take that one, yeah. All right. So, um... For every insurance policy you issue, or let me put it, an insurance contract, there are terms and conditions in it. And the insurance liabilities is based on those uh, conditions in it. And you have to uh, model it based on those terms of contracts, the terms in the contract. So even if you don't have data, the terms of the contract might give you a and information to come up with your, your liabilities. It is the actuals that you need to make sure that what you expect is the actuals you have received. So IFR 17 says project your, your expectations. And now when the year comes to an end, look at your expectation and make sure is it the is the estimating the same as actuals. If your actuals is more than your expected. Whichever way it is, whether it's uh, claims or premiums, either affect your insurance service results. So it is more of the terms of the contract and how you are managing that risk. Then the data is supported by you making sure that it is there to vet it. So you should get your data there. But because you're a new company, you can do an assumption or modifications or whatever suits your business process to get to the end of the IFR 17 process. Hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, uh, any remarks on that from our auditors? Emmanuel, Charlotte, anyone to yes, remark on um, data, data, is, data is key. And um, as part of our processes as auditors, we have to test the completeness and accuracy of the data that is being used. Um, if the data is not available, Richie, like you know, what what is the cost of the effort that you have to put in in getting um, the most recent data um, against the benefit that will be derived from from that data? So all of those will be assessed, and then we see whether um, whichever data you have available. Um, current data or, or historic, um, when that is used in um, estimating the numbers and working out the revenue numbers is going to result in a fair statement of those numbers, then a conclusion will then be drawn. Hmm. Okay, all right. All right, yeah, so I want, to add, I want to add this, that um, for I-17, we have various transition methodologies. And based on your, your peculiar circumstances, 
you can do the fair value approach just to make sure that um, you are in compliance with IFRSM. If you cannot get historical data, just to add that, thanks. Okay. All right, uh, thank you very much. In fact, um, we are hard pressed for time and, uh, and I've been alerted that uh, we are getting over time. So um, for the questions that I have in the chat box, I'm looking at them quite a lot of them. Um, Hager and myself and an auditors will sit and then we'll try and then answer all of them and then we'll share them via the emails for which you registered with. So please uh, take note of that. Um, at this moment, uh, Mr. Ousu, uh, if you are with us, any, any final comments from your side before maybe uh, we can let go of our panelists? Okay, so thank, thank you. I think, I think the panel, they have done justice to um, the, the questions. Um, so, so Mr. Mate answered the question, and I think Hega also added, and um, shall also then, in terms of the Audit is of the audit has not changed. So um, your audit methodology, your assets still remains the same. Um, your premium will still remain the same. Whatever you get as your claim also remains the same. So it's the accounting and the reporting that, that is actually uh, changing. Uh, there's a lot of estimation that has been built into, into this uh, in, in IFRS 17. Uh, in IFRS 4, we're still doing some estimation, but we're only doing estimation only for the insurance liabilities. And that was the only thing that you introduced. So we were taking uh, things easy. And um, once we get the actuaries to do that, and we get Hager and their team to check it for us, and uh, whatever difference that it was throwing, then there you go. Then you go and check your other premiums and the rest of it. Now they are all changing. And, and I think like the team said, Charlotte and the team said, we are all starting. It's not something that anybody uh, already uh, know. And we should be open about this. We should look for support. There's enormous support that are, are available. Um, uh, NIC guide uh, is, is a good uh, starting point. And um, if you are looking for any information and you can get, uh, reach out to us and uh, we have a team um, our team are ready uh, we have an actuary team that's always putting us on the spot and then we have our audit team that is also ready to help with a checklist of things that you need to uh, look at as you prepare uh, to meet your external auditors um, I think uh, we thought that this was going to be so important at this point um, to just gauge the market and to see how people are getting ready. I'm sure that there's going to be a second one, maybe after where we can assess how the first year of the audit have gone and the lessons that um, we have all learned in, in the process. Um, so once again, thank you. I've seen my boss. Uh, there are a lot of people on the call, but I can't refuse to recognize Nanasaki. Uh, Nana is a call. Nana, thank you very much for, for joining. I think a uh, few of my people and my friends are on the call. Um, you are all very, very important, and, and we appreciate um, your time uh, to join us for this. And look forward for our future uh, webinars uh, that are uh, going to be coming very soon. So once again, thank you on behalf of the firm. Thank you all for and the panelists. Well done uh, for dealing with the questions. Please, if your questions have not been answered, um, Make sure that Richard and Kabna and Hager and uh, all the team, they will get their answers and we will share that. So leave your emails and the things across and we'll make sure we get back to you. Once again, thank you very much and uh, have thank a Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Usu. We appreciate you and we appreciate everyone for joining. Kabna, you want to put a word or two? Oh, uh, if, if the overall boss had spoken <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yes, that has spoken for all of us thank you yeah okay thank you so uh, thanks everyone for joining we really appreciate your time and we look forward to uh, contacting you individually with your uh, answers um, that you have requested for and then if you need any support please do not hesitate 
I am here, Hega is here, the audit team is always here to always answer and then support you. Thank you and have a very, very wonderful day today. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you, bye. Uh, thank you, my panelists. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.